Well, thank you. Um, hoping the technology will get us there on this thing. But um, thank you indeed for the honour of being asked to um, speak to the IMO lecture, uh, particularly as a mere school teacher when it's usually some eminent professor or Fields medalist. Um, I do have a particular soft spot for the IMO lecture because it was where I first met the lady who is now my wife. Actually, it was the third time I'd met her, but the first two she doesn't remember, so they don't count. <laughs> but uh, the Romanian polygon game, well, before I talk about that, um, I better explain why I've ended up here, which is that for the past nine years I've been responsible for setting the BMO1 and BMO2 papers, or at least the head of the committee that sets it. Um, but finally I got the shove, and um, part of that was part of the reason was this question, uh, which those of you um, who did BMO1 last year might have painful memories of, um, including one or two of the people who were standing up here in the team who, who didn't manage to get it out. Um, as chairman, I have to take full responsibility for the, the um, difficulty of this question. Uh, and actually, I must also admit that it was a problem that I came up with. Um, so I'm not going to say any more about it, apart from to, well, to, to, to apologize. Um, and also to comment that, uh, I mean, actually all you need to do to solve this problem is to do very long and accurate algebra. And there were lots of contestants who got halfway. They were very good at long algebra. So, the Romanian polygon game, where did this come from? Well, it, this has already been mentioned, the Romanian Masters of Mathematics competition that some of these folk were on, um, hosted each February by Romania, and it's only the top teams typically in the IMO who, who get invited to it. And the problems are as difficult as, as the IMO itself, so they've got three problems to solve in four and a half hours. And uh, this is one of them from 2015. Um, I, last year, I, I went to Romania for, for the 2018 IMO team, and I enjoyed great hospitality from them. And I am not going to repay that hospitality by murdering their language. That's a privilege that belongs only to the IMO president. So I will uh, find a translation for you. So this was where the Romanian polygon game first appeared. For an integer n greater than or equal to 5, two players play the following game on a regular polygon. Initially, three consecutive vertices are chosen and one counter is placed on each. A move consists of one player sliding one counter along any number of edges to another vertex of the polygon without jumping over another counter. A move is legal if the area of the triangle formed by the counters is strictly greater after the move than before. The players take turns to make legal moves, and if a player cannot make a legal move, the player, that player loses. For which values of n does the player making the first move have a winning strategy? Well, if that doesn't make much sense, I'm going to try and... Um, show you a demonstration of the polygon game. So I have two volunteers to come and help with that. Um, once again, see if I can get the technology to work for me. Um, these two randomly picked volunteers were, um, they were team toilet at IMO 2019, the faithful invigilators who wrote down every single visit to and from the toilet. Um, so if you want to understand the UK team's pit stop strategy, they are the people to ask. But for now, let's play the Romanian polygon game. So first we need to choose how many vertices, how big the polygon's going to be. So, Patricia? Fifteen. Fifteen. So we'll stick with fifteen vertices. Okay. Um, so the other player, Isaac, um, do you want to start or do you want to go second? Go second. Okay, Patricia. So you've got your three counters there on zero, one, and two. Quite a small triangle at the moment, and we've got to make it bigger. What um, what counter do you want to move, and where do you want to go? Um, I'll move zero to eleven. 
0 to 11. Uh, so that's the red triangle is definitely bigger than the blue one, so that's a, a, a legal move. Excellent. Isaac. Two to seven. Uh, so once again, it's the red triangle that counts, and that one is definitely bigger than the green one we just had. So, Patricia, your move. Seven to eight. Seven to eight. Uh, that seems to be smaller. I think we need. Oh, I misread the number. I meant six. Sorry. Seven what? to six. And that is bigger. Isaac. Um, I don't believe there is anything possible. So um, he doesn't think, and I, I think he's right, you cannot make the triangle any bigger, and therefore Patricia has won. So hopefully that um, the game now makes more sense. Um, let's see whether I can get the uh, is that better. Excellent. So we're back to the the um, slideshow. So that is is the game, and we've seen it demonstrated. Um, so the big question here really is when will the area increase? Now, at first sight, it looks as though this is a horrible geometry problem. Um, I am no good at geometry. Uh, the only way I can do geometry is either turn it into coordinates or complex numbers or trigonometry. Uh, but actually, it turns out here that the, the geometry is quite straightforward and simple here um, because we've just got the issue of the areas of the triangles. And when you make a move, so here we've moved from the blue one to the red one, the base is staying the same. So when's the area going to get bigger? Well, it's if the perpendicular height increases. So all we need to do to get a bigger triangle is to be able to get the perpendicular height to increase. And what that means in terms of the numbers is the number of edges must become more equal. Um, so you can see with the, the um, blue triangle, it's sort of got two and six edges between them. And then when you get to the red one, it's sort of four and four edges between them, and so the area is increased. So that's the only thing that matters. And when is the game going to finish? Well, it finishes when you end up with an equilateral triangle. That happened for n equals 15. Or sometimes that's impossible, and it could be just that the, the game, um, the shortest and longest, differ by one, as it were. So um, if you go away and play this game lots of times and um, ignore a few rogue results, um, you should find that you get this sort of table of who wins and who doesn't. Uh, which at first sight is not very revealing. Uh, player two seems to have the advantage, but it's not obvious the pattern why as, as to why the second person has an advantage or if indeed whether that carries on. Now, the Romanian polygon game is, is a, an example of what I call terminating games. These are games that are definitely going to finish. Um, so Othello... 64 squares eventually filled up. That's going to finish. Noughts and crosses, I'm sure we've all played, uh, which finishes quite quickly. Um, and there's a few others I, I might well, talk about in a moment. Um, other games that are not terminating games, chess, there's a special rule to stop it going on forever. Um, but the basic rules of chess, it's not going to terminate necessarily. And drafts, because you can start going backwards, equally may not terminate and there's another one that I may mention in a moment. So terminating games normally only have finitely many possible positions. And the moves between those positions only work in one direction. And so in particular, you can't get any sort of loops going around positions you've been in before. And there are no infinite sequences. So eventually, we're going to reach a finishing position with a definite result. So it might be a win, a draw, or a lose, or it may be you even get a sort of numerical score. Um, let me just briefly talk about this game 15. Uh, with 15, you start with cards numbered 1 to 9 in the middle of the table. Each player picks one card in turn to add to their hand, 
And if you can look at three of your cards and add them up to 15 uh, without a calculator, then uh, you win. Um, but it's a draw if neither player has a 15 when all the cards have been taken. Now, not sure who's going to win there, or possibly a draw, but it's definitely going to finish, isn't it? Because there's only nine cards in the middle. It's going to finish after nine moves. Uh, this is another one, which is my favourite. Uh, it's a game called Hex. Um, I was introduced to this game by a chap called Norman Routledge, who was one of my teachers at school. Um, he was also leader for the first ever uh, UK team at the IMO back in 1967, and he was also deputy leader the following year. Um, and we used to play this at the end of term um, with him. So what happens in Hex? Well, you've got these squares. The green player's trying to make a wiggly line between his two sides. Um, the red player is trying to create a wiggly line between her two sides, and you're sort of each taking it in turns. You can put your counter wherever you like. Um, it is an incredibly subtle game. Um, computers these days are quite good at it, but it took quite a long time to get computers good at it. Um, Nim, this one's quite well known. Um, I, I won't say very much on this, but it's taking matchsticks um, from piles, and the person who takes the last match wins. Um, there is actually, I said these games are normally finite. There is actually a transfinite game, a version of Nim. Once again, this is certainly something you can look up um, and find out about it. This one has a sort of strange variation. You've got match boxes as well as matches. And if you take a match box, or at least one match box from a par, you can replace it by lots of matches, as many as you like. And this is why the game is not actually finite, but actually... If you start with a finite number of matchboxes, it has got to end eventually. Um, it turns out, well, it is essentially the same strategy as for the finite version, but it gets a bit more complicated. Uh, this one I mentioned briefly, three noughts and three crosses. Uh, it's like noughts and crosses. You're trying to get a, um, a line of three crosses or noughts, uh, but that's where the pieces start, and you only ever have three pieces each and you move them round. This one works better if you make it out of wood rather than trying to do it on paper. And that turns out this game actually never ends if you play it perfectly, if you know what you're doing. Um, why, we, why, why study combinatorial? Well, these are what are sometimes known as combinatorial games, and, and one reason, may not be the best reason, um, but they do have a habit of appearing in... Um, Olympiad questions from time to time. So this one was from some years ago, before my time as, as, as uh, chair. Um, Alice and Barbara playing with a pack of cards with positive integers. I'm not going to solve this one for us because actually it's quite a good one to go away and look up on the um, BMO website and have a go at. But prove that Alice can always win. Um, a bit more recently, some of you might remember this one um, from a couple of years ago. Naomi and Tom playing a game where they're picking integers. And this one is certainly um, likewise very accessible, worth thinking about, looking up, having a go at. So how do you work out who should win a, a, a finite game, terminating game? Well, in one sense, it's very straightforward. Um, what you do is you just look at the final positions. So the final positions, you know who's going to win, who's going to draw, who's going to lose. And then you look at who is, um, well, what leads to those positions, and you decide what's your best strategy going to be. Um, so if um, we're um, max thinking about what we should play on the third move, um, up the top where we're, we're definitely going to pick one of the lose for many, aren't we? Um, and so actually that position for Max is going to be a losing position. So basically the current player can win if they can move to any loss for the other player. On the other hand, the current player must lose if they can only move to wins for the other player. And so you sort of work backwards. So um, that's the sort of Max's 
the, the third move of the game, as it were. So I'm working backwards from the final fourth move. Um, that's what is going to happen for Max, because he's going to choose um, losing positions where he can, and so on. And then Minnie thinks, well, what's Minnie going to do? She's going to try and avoid those wins for Max, if she can, and, and plump for where Max is going to be losing. Uh, and so that's what Minnie would do on the second go of the game. And then finally, well, what's Max going to do? Well, if he plays down the bottom, he's going to win. Um, sorry, he's going to, sorry, Minnie's going to win, so he wouldn't want the red one. Uh, the yellow one turns into a draw, and then the, the green one at the top, he's going to win. So he, obviously he's going to plump for that. So here, Max is definitely going to win. So uh, working backwards, and to put it in a slightly different way, uh, the first player, Max, he's always going to choose a move leading to the maximum score. And Minnie, she's always going to choose a move leading to the minimal score. And so you sort of work backwards and you can work out the scores and then finally you get to the starting position and it tells you who's going to win, who's going to lose. That all sounds very simple, but when you've got a game like Hex with 121 squares, you begin to suddenly realise actually that's not simple because there's an awful lot of possibilities and no computer anywhere could have a hope of doing that. So what we want to do is to try and work out um, how to sort of characterise what's a winning position, what's a losing position. So returning to the, the Romanian polygon game, this turns out to be the big idea. So this is the time to wake up. Um, in any Olympiad problem, that the, there comes a point where you go from getting not many marks at all to getting a lot. In the British Maths Olympiad, um, if you've just got bits and pieces, normally the, your best score is going to be 3 out of 10. But then suddenly, if you get the key idea, or a suitable, sometimes there's more than one key idea you could go, once you've got that key idea, you're up to 7 marks out of 10. So this is the big moment. So we start thinking about scalene triangles. So a scalene triangle where the three edges have different lengths. So we're currently at the blue one. Um, we're in that blue triangle, and we're thinking about moving. And the key is always to move the... We're going to move the vertex 14, because that's between the shortest and longest sides. So where are we going to move it to? Well, possibly we're going to move it to the 14 to the 12. And that gets... An, so you can see there's an isosceles, green, dark green isosceles triangle there. Now... It may be that that is a losing position for the next player, in which case we're going to stop there. But it's possible that that 12 is a winning position for the, the green player, the, the dark green from that dark green triangle. And if that's the case, well, where can you move to from 12? Well, the only places that get you a bigger triangle are 11, 10, or 9. So if... 12 is a winning position for the next player, then they could move either to 11 or 10 or 9 to make the other player lose. So what do we do? Well, if we're the blue player, we are going to go, in that situation, we're going to go straight through the 12 and we're going to go to what would win for the other player. So either you stop at the isosceles triangle, if it's going to make you win the game, or you've got to be able to carry on past the isosceles triangle and find a winning position. Let's look at one more example of this, since it really is the key idea. Um, so slightly different setup, but same idea. So we're in the blue triangle, and we're going to move that piece that's at the 14. And we can move it to the isosceles triangle, which is at 12. So either that is a losing position for the next player, so we'll stop there, or the only place that they could carry on to, so the only way that 12 can win is if they move to 11. But if they're going to win with 11, we beat them to it because we move straight there to 11. Conclusion, whenever we have a scaling triangle, we are going to win this game. So... What happens if we're at an isosceles triangle? Now, the important thing about this game is we're going to start with an isosceles triangle. 
Um, if we started with a scalene triangle, the first player would always win. So, um, well, what happens? So, if we are an isosceles triangle, well, if we're in that red triangle, um, there's no way to move to another isosceles triangle. If you count the number of edges, um, the long, well, the short edges are three, and the log ed long edges are both six. So there's no way that we can move to another isosceles triangle. On the other hand, if we are at that green triangle, uh, we've got th a three and a three and a, and a uh, six, and we can even things up. We can actually move to that red triangle. So the red triangle is definitely losing. The green triangle is definitely winning. So basically our only hope, if we are going to win the game, the only hope is to keep moving to an isosceles triangle. And there's at most one available. Uh, let's look at some numerical examples then to, to go back to where, where we started. So um, if we start with an 11-sided polygon, the starting position is a 1 and a 1, and then if you count all the way around the, the polygon, it's 1 and a 1 and a 9. So if we're in that situation, uh, the only isosceles thing available is to go to 1 plus 5 plus 5. Uh, but then you can take the 1 and the 5 and turn it into a 3 plus a 3 plus a 5. And then finally we can do a 3 and a 5 and replace them by a 4 and a 4. And at this point, you can't move to another isosceles triangle because 3 is even, 4 is, no, 3 is odd, 4 is even. And in fact, you can't move at all from that position. Um, on the other hand, on the right, we started with 15 vertices, so this is what should have happened. So you work out whether they did the right thing or not. This is what should have happened in the game they played. 1 plus 1 plus 13. Um, so the best bet is to move to an isosceles triangle, 1 plus 7 plus 7, and then you take the 1 and the 7 and you replace it by 4 plus 4 plus 7. Now at this point, you can't move to another isosceles triangle, but you've got to make a move because you can, but you will move to a scalene triangle and then that person will win. So um, to sum up, you can sort of work backwards like we did in those um, spreadsheets and you see that for 15, the first player to play um, will, should lose, and with 11 vertices, the first player to play should win. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I must just get some water to drink. This was uh, one of my things I got back from Romania, which is a very useful water bottle. It also has the, the wonderful uh, slogan on it from the Bank of Transylvania, which says, you have to be odd to be number one, which uh, was certainly true of that team. But, uh... So isosceles triangles in general. <clears throat> if we do a bit of algebra, it's not going to be the awful algebra you saw earlier, but if we do a little bit of algebra, if you start off with side lengths A, A, A plus A plus B, um, you're going to average the A and the B, so you get A plus B over 2, A plus B over 2. And the important thing is the difference between the longest side and the shortest. So to begin with, our difference is B minus A, but then it's A plus B over 2 minus A. So actually what you're noticing, and if you look back at the numbers, you should have seen that, the, the difference between the biggest and the smallest is halving every time. So the qu big question comes is, uh, well, where's that going to end, as it were? So if you look at the highest power of 2 that goes into the number, so you can keep out on taking out factors of 2 until you're left with an odd number. And the important thing is, how many of those factors of 2 do we have? So if you don't have any factors of two, you are going to lose straight away. You know, the current player either can't move or they've got to move to a scaling triangle. If k is an odd number, you should always be able to win by removing one of those factors of two and putting the other person into a losing position. And if k is even, so what should happen with this game is that difference keeps on halving, and when the first person can't halve it, they're going to lose. And if we think then about the initial position, um, there are n 
edges, but you've got um, you've got a one and a one, and then it's going to be n minus two makes it up to n. So the starting difference isn't going to be n, but it's going to be n minus three. So to go back to that table, who won and, and why, what you've got to do is to look at those numbers. And so rather than the number of sides, we think about the number of sides minus three. And you just keep looking for your powers of two. Um, so for example, if you have 11 sides, then um, we're looking at eight. That's two cubed. That's an odd power. And therefore, um, you should be able to win from there. Um, on the other hand, if you've got 15 sides, then um, you've got n minus 3 is 12. You've got a factor of 2 squared. That's an even power of 2. And therefore, it should be the second player who ends up winning. And uh, so that sort of explains what, at first sight, looked quite a mysterious collection of, of wins and losses. So to sum up then, uh, the strategy if you want to get good at the Romanian polygon game. In some senses, this is one of those games which actually, because it has got a perfect strategy and it's possible to work out the perfect strategy, it becomes a pretty pointless game to play. It's an interesting game to study, but not such great spectator sport, really, or, or to participate. But you should always move the vertex between the shortest and longest sides. If you can't move to an isosceles triangle, give up. If exactly one isosceles triangle is available, you've got to move to that, and you don't need to think about it. On the other hand, if you can see two isosceles triangles, you've got to try and work out which is the better, and that's where you've got to do a bit of calculation, look for your powers of two, and see whether you've got odd or even. And you always move to the one where k, will, where k is even. Um, a few sort of follow-up questions. It looked as though... The, um, first, the, the first player was winning less than the second player, but what was the proportion in the long term? Um, and you can actually do that calculation. Uh, clearly, there's something about halving here, so powers of four. So you look at n minus three. Um, if you think about everything up to four to the power of r, well, about half of those games have n minus three odd, and that's losing straight away. Um, if that's not the case, then you think about what, when you, what happens when you halve it. And if you halve it and get an odd integer, the other player's going to lose, so you're going to win. On the other hand, some of the time you're going to go down two steps, and you're going to halve it and halve it again, which on a good day means you divide by four. And then you get back to a position which, well, I'm not sure about. But you can set up this sort of recurrence relation to count it. So the number of wins from... Um, 4 to the r is, well, half the time you're going to win straight away. Um, no, sorry, a quarter, um, quarter of the time you're going to win straight away. Half the time you're going to lose straight away. And then you've got this number of wins from a smaller number. And you can actually spot that that recurrence is, is um, a geometric progression. If you've learned about those and learned how to sum them, you might recognize that formula at the bottom. But the take-home really is that the first player wins about a third of the time, and the second player wins two-thirds of the time. Sometimes um, you always end up with isosceles triangles. Usually what happens in a game, if you just pick a random number, is that actually at some point you end up with a scalene triangle, and someone has to think hard about where they go next. Um, although they know they, once you've reached a scalene triangle, you know that you should be winning this game, so it's very embarrassing if you, if you make the wrong move at that point. But it's not trivial to work it out. But sometimes, for example, n equals 11 is one of those where we're, where we're isosceles the whole time. So what happened in Romania in 2015? Well, uh, with this, comp th with this um, so it was problem two, if you remember. And these were the average marks. So in international competitions, it tends to be marked out of seven. I don't know why, but it's um, the way they do it. So on this one, um, on the, if you remember, each day, the, so problems one and four are meant to be the easy problems. 
Um, problems two and five are meant to be the medium ones, and problems three and six are meant to be the hard ones. Um, and then, actually, if you look at the scores, well, certainly internationally, question two didn't go quite as well as question five. Um, a bit better than problem three, so it was actually quite a hard medium problem, this one. Uh, that year, so there were 98 students from 15 countries, and the United Kingdom came fourth. And the way the scoring works in Romania is they only look at the top three of each team. I don't know why, but that's the traditional way. Uh, what about the United Kingdom? How did they do? Well, um, some of them may well be in this room, so I'm not going to embarrass them by names, but um, by numbers, this was uh, their, their scores. So looking down problem two, they uh, actually... Four of them got it out and two didn't. So I think it shows that we were better than average on, on the combinator combinatorics. And I promise you that they were not told in advance uh, about this problem. Um, this was meant to be a bit of a sort of reveal at this point, but, but Dominic's already revealed it, that actually I am responsible for this game. So it's not really Romanian at all, uh, since I am not Romanian. Um, but this was um, yeah, the problem as it was translated into English in the, in the original version. We have, I mean, as was mentioned, we, we actually have a good recent tradition of providing lots of these problems. The tradition is when you turn up. So actually this year in Bath was the one time we didn't provide problems because we were the hosts. And the, 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 the understanding is as guests you come along and bring, rather than bringing them flowers or chocolates, you bring maths problems to... Uh, <laughs> To, to give to the, to the competition. Let's just return. We've got, got a few more minutes, so um, let's return to this game of 15. So you have your cards numbered 1 to 9 in the middle, and you're picking cards, and you're trying to look for three cards in your hand that add up to 15. What do we reckon? Win, draw, or lose for the first player? Anyone? Got any insight into what's going on here? Yes. You think it's a draw. Brave man. Why do you think it's a draw? Is he right? There you go. Magic square. I'm sure you've seen that magic square before. Uh, the numbers one to nine. They can be put essentially only one way onto the square grid such that um, horizontally and diagonally they all add up to 15. So in fact this turns out to be a very familiar game which as if we played it uh, we're probably aware that it ought to end up as a draw. It's a lovely example I think that of if you look at a problem in the right way you suddenly actually see it's a problem I've solved before. What about hex? Kate Bush once sung in one of her songs, the more I think about hex, the better it gets. At least I think that's what she sings. But. So what's going on here? Um, and who should win? Well, this is, uh, is a nice example of a game. So let's um, think of a, of a little bit about this. First of all, there are 121 factorial possible gains. Um, that is a finite number. So in theory, we could work out who wins, who should win. Um, but in practice, that number is far too big to do anything with. The important thing in hex is you can never end in a draw. And the reason for that is that really the only way to stop the other person winning is by getting a line right across the board. And if you've got a line right across the board, you've won. Another thing, and having an extra piece is always an advantage. You never, there's some games where it could be a disadvantage, but not here. Um, so it turns out the first player does have a winning strategy. And this is something that happens in quite a few of these games. And to some extent, that's what's happening in the Romanian Polygon game. It's what you call strategy stealing. And the thinking is this, well, just suppose the second player has a way of winning. Well, let's see whether we can imitate it, and win. Uh, it turns out we can always win as first player, but no one knows quite how, but this is basically the thinking why we must have a winning strategy. 
Well, let's suppose that the second player does have a winning strategy. They would be able to win in by move 120, because it will be the first player taking the last move, if there is one. Um, so what does the first player do? Well, he just plays um, a piece randomly anywhere on the board. And both players do their best to ignore that random piece. And if that's the case, then the second player is now the first player, so they are losing. So if they are losing, they must have a losing move. Well, they, they must have lots of losing moves, one of which doesn't involve the random hex. So it's possible that moving in the random hex would make them lose, but there's definitely another losing move for them. Um, and so now the first player is what was the second player, so they are now due to win. Um, the only complication comes is just time to time they've actually already played the piece that their strategy tells them they should play. And if that's the case, they just play another random move. And so essentially they've got to win by move 121. So in theory, they must always win. Um, in practice, if I'm playing my son, I don't always win when I'm going first. Um, but um, it's a, it is a subtle game. And actually, I, I do commend it to you if you can find a board to, to play it with. So I mentioned at the, the, the start um, that I'm stepping down as, as BMO chairman, and I gave you one reason why that's happening. And, and I, I, there is a further reason, which um, I will finish with. Um, as I said, I am no good at geometry. And it has always been my ambition to try and get a geometry problem into BMO1 or BMO2. And I have singularly failed. So if you hate the geometry problems on BMO1 or BMO2, I'm OK with that, because I didn't write them. Uh, this was my best attempt, um, but it was binned. The excuse for this is that if you know what's going on, there is a well-known theorem of geometry which makes it quite easy. Um, but actually, the real reason is that it was a joke that they thought was best binned or banned or something. Uh, so archaeologist Montana Smith finds the fabled temple of geometry. In it, she sees stone spheres of radius 1, 2, and 3, which touch each other externally. A thin golden circle of wire touches each of the three stone spheres. It is the smallest possible circle with this property. Unfortunately, the longest of the three sections of the circle has been stolen. Now, as a PMO question, that probably doesn't make a lot of sense there, really, because, well, in a sense, the punchline has been removed. What are we supposed to do with this information? Um, and uh, I know there's one or two people at Tunbridge School who, who, who know the punchline, and they're going to stay quiet. And I was just wondering whether anyone else has worked out what the punchline was to this bins band geometry joke. This could go horribly wrong, and I'm OK with that if you don't find it. Yes? Um, it's, well, it's, it's got a connection with that, but yes. And it, it, is important. It, is impor it is important that it was stolen. But, uh. um, if you don't get it, then um, ask someone who, who did find it funny. But um, you're welcome to go away and try that problem. It's not going to appear in print for obvious reasons. But um, at that note, I, I will finish.